Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. There's something extremely interesting about the concept of having an entire army of clones. If we can brush aside the ethical concerns, of which there are many, what we end up having is a massive pool of individuals with exactly the same DNA with very small variances at the genetic level, which kind of gives us the perfect experiment to do all sorts of tests on human development, on whether nature or nurture is more important, and what environmental factors actually change our personality and our health and physical appearance. If you guys ever took a research class in high school or in higher education, you'll know that one of the most difficult parts of any study is isolating the parameter you're trying to test. Let's say for a thesis paper, you want to do an in-depth study on what Mountain Dew does to the size of a man's wee-wee, which is not something I did in college for school at all. We can have two groups, a control group who does drink Mountain Dew and the experimental group that does not. Penile measurements can be done for both groups, maybe on a monthly basis for a few years to see if there are any changes from the control and experimental group. But here's the problem, you can't really control what these individuals do. You only get to see them once a month. And even if they do promise to stick to a specific regime and only consume certain types of beverage, you can't trust everyone, and more importantly, there are other factors that maybe you didn't think about that will affect your end results. Maybe the guys in the control group aren't having Mountain Dew, which is good, but maybe they're doing other things that might shrink the size of their PP, like buying a lifted Wrangler for no reason. In an ideal situation when running such experiments, researchers would prefer to control every aspect of the subject's environment so that they can truly isolate them and everything that is going into their bodies. But of course, that would create very strong ethical concerns about that study. But thankfully, we have soulless, dolphin-like Kaminoans in the Star Wars galaxy and the Sif to finance their crazy experiments to basically perform one of the largest experiments on what shapes human development. You know, the setup here is perfect for this. Uh, every clone is basically born in a test tube in a very heavily controlled environment. Their embryos are created from the DNA of Django Fett, a famous bounty hunter chosen for his physical abilities and temperament. Well, actually not everything was perfect with Django. He wasn't exactly soldier material. He was too strong-minded and independent, which is a problematic trait for a rank and file trooper to have. Now, one of the things the Kaminoans were experts at were isolating specific genes that express certain type of traits that they want or don't want. Genetic modification, that's their game. The Kaminoans wanted the clones to keep Django's bravery, resilience, intelligence, and confidence, but at the same time exhibit less independence and be more willing to work for others, and perhaps more importantly, follow orders. One could argue that all of these traits are generally not found in the same person, uh, but the Kaminoans were perfectionists and eager to try to create the perfect human soldier. And they also created workarounds like the inhibitor chip, which uh, further conditions clones to be loyal, even if uh, they are naturally very obedient. And it wasn't an easy process, actually. There are a lot of proto batches of clones that were kind of failures. Some of them might have been discarded. We are dealing with uh, Kaminoans who culturally are very comfortable with culling undesirable or weak members of a species for the greater good. It is rumored that some of those earlier batches were indeed turned into protein squares and then fed to the general population. Anyway, despite some modifications, the point is every clone has the same DNA more or less, and on Typica City, the Kaminoans have mass produced training and living facilities that make sure that they have completely uniform upbringings. And so the experiments that are carried out uh, are basically when clones deviate from the standard path, when they start getting deployed or having specialized training. For instance, some batches of clone commandos were trained by Mandalorian mercenaries in the Kul Valdar. They were taught Mandoa, the dialect, and adopted into Mandalorian warrior culture. It was later found that these units were far more resilient and suffered less casualties than non-Mando trained groups. A classic example of how nurture and culture can really change how effective a soldier is. This is one of the many ways that a clone can deviate from the standard clone. And by the last year of the Clone Wars, that's exactly where we were. The individual clones were all different. They had different voices, different uh, balding patterns, different personalities. A clear sign that their genes were expressing different instructions, despite their shared DNA. Now let's talk about DNA and, and kind of clear up some misconceptions about what it is and what it isn't. Our DNA code is the blueprint of who we are 
and it is represented as a double helix ladder formation. On the rungs, we have pairs of nucleobases labeled as A, T, C, G. You might remember this from, you know, school when you were a kid. So each small grouping of letters represents a gene. This is the actual instruction that goes to your cells and then changes who you are as a person. It's common belief that when a person is born, the DNA that they have does not change throughout one's life. Sure, DNA can degrade from age and exposure to radiation to Mountain Dew and other environmental factors, but what you start out with is what you get at the end. Except that's not 100% accurate. So our DNA sequence has a lot of genes on them, but actually not all of them are gonna be switched on. As a matter of fact, if you had all of your genes switched on, you'd probably look like the rock in Doom 3, which is, which is not a good look. That is where the next layer in genetic expression comes into play, epigenetics, which literally means over the genes. And so your body can create different types of chemical markers that can switch off certain genes. There are many different factors that can actually affect one's epigenome, and we're gonna explain how each one of these can change a clone trooper in the long run and deviate them from the others in the group. So the older we get, the more we replicate our cells, the more our epigenome changes. This is known as epigenetic shift. The markers that control which genes should be expressed or not lose their precision over time. One of the key processes in gene regulation is known as DNA methylation. Methylation of a DNA molecule is where certain chemicals tie themselves onto the genes and then silence said genes. And actually one of the best ways to determine a person's biological age is by looking at their methylation patterns. Generally, newborns have very active and healthy DNA methylation patterns, which helps tightly regulate which genes are turned on and off. And that generally tapers off the older you get. When the methylation patterns no longer are healthy, that's when you start seeing all sorts of uh, aging issues, aging disease, and on the other side of the spectrum, cancerous growths and tumors. Now, the clones are quite unique in the fact that the Kaminoans altered their DNA to speed up their aging, almost twice the rate of the average human being. This was done, of course, to save money and time on their growth and training. The only problem with this alteration of their DNA is that their time in the prime of their life was also shortened. Instead of having maybe 20 years of peak performance between the age of 18 and 38, uh, now it's more like from the ages of nine to 19. 10 years. How did the Gaminoans do this? Well, most likely a mix of genetic engineering and epigenetic reprogramming. They probably modified genes related to growth hormone and cell cycle regulation. The challenge was to speed up the aging of these clones without also introducing chaotic growth like cancer, like tumors, or creating just neurological deficiencies that made clones mad, which actually happened quite a lot uh, later on in the war when they tried other types of cloning like the Spartite clones, which only took one year to basically grow a full human being. The Kaminoans also created environments and diets that supported rapid tissue growth and bone development, also known colloquially as the Cheesecake Factory. I imagine the downside of this type of advanced aging is by the time the clones get to mid-age at around 20 years in their time and 40 years in regular human being life, the methylation patterns in their epigenomes are pretty out of whack, which leads to all sorts of anomalies and issues with the body, which means unfortunately not only do things go downhill pretty rapidly for a clone once they are in the second half of their life, they also experience higher rates of aging diseases like organ failure and also higher rates of cancerous growth. Another reason why they're abrupt, I wouldn't even say retirement because they weren't really retired, they're just decommissioned. Another reason why the decommissioning is so dark. In the clone's most difficult moments, they'll be left to fend for themselves and they won't be properly trained to handle the rapid unraveling of their epigenetic system. This is also why in older clones like the 501st, or better yet, Rex, Gregor, and Wolf in Rebels, we begin to see much more variation in personality, temperament, and appearance between the different clones in the unit. It should be mentioned that later batches of clones faced even more problems uh, from their epigenetic system. This is because of the degradation of the FET donor DNA. Uh, once Django was killed, that genosis, the Kaminoans ran out of their fresh supply of genetic material and were instead forced to use copied and lower level genetic material to create the newest batches. If we take a look at the clone trooper Tup, a pretty well adjusted and talented clone who joined the 501st a few years uh, into the war, something happened with his body's immune system where it started attacking the inhibitor chip in his brain, making him psychotic. When the biochip was extracted from him later on and, and an autopsy was done, 
on that trip, it was clear that it had started decaying and, and rotting in his head, which is, which is not good. Okay, so this is the most interesting factor to changing one's epigenome, and that is stress. And it's interesting because we are dealing with very stressed out individuals. These are soldiers. Stress, trauma, and just repeated exposure to horrible environments can change our epigenome. This is probably the most surprising uh, part of the video for most people, right? It's not something we really think about when we talk about our DNA changing. If you have grandparents who were born in the early 20th century, they probably lived through one of the most chaotic periods in human history, at least in modern times. And whether they were in the East or the West, the North or South, things were relatively unstable and shitty almost everywhere. Things were far worse than even what we're going through right now. Trust me. They were. And there have been numerous studies now about how stress severely changed and messed with people's genetics. In 1944 to 1945, the Nazis blockaded the Netherlands, causing a famine, which unfortunately left many pregnant women severely malnourished. It was later found out that children who were born during this famine exhibited lower DNA methylation in IGF2. This is the gene that is associated with growth. And it makes sense. It makes sense that the body would shut down the gene that helps the body grow because you are trying to conserve resources during the famine. So focusing on staying alive is far more important than growth. This epigenetic shift was passed down from pregnant women to their children and uh, kids who have this gene subdued have increased risk of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease later on in life. And some of these kids had children of their own and they would also pass down this genetic suppression to them as well. Amongst many Holocaust survivors, it was found that their gene FKBP5 also had lower methylation. FKBP5 regulates stress hormones or your cortisol system. Individuals with this epigenetic shift showcase higher levels of anxiety and have less resilience against post-traumatic stress disorder. Unfortunately, this was also passed down to the children of Holocaust survivors. And so when your Jewish friends talk about like generational trauma, this is what it is from a biological standpoint. Similar research was done uh, to Chinese survivors of Mao's Great Leap Forward Famine in 1959. It's found that children conceived during this time had a higher risk of schizophrenia, obesity, and diabetes even decades later on. Studies found similar epigenetic shifts in the Chinese population compared to the Dutch population that went through their famine in 1944 and 1945. So yeah, these large historical events not only create tragedy uh, during the times that they're happening, but they also create this genetic ticking bomb in the victimized population, which is just next levels of messed up. And so how does this affect our clone troopers? Well, resiliency is very important personality trait for seeing how susceptible people are to high levels of stress and whether that triggers PTSD or mental reactions. Now, believe it or not, childhood adversity or just like trauma uh, being afflicted on a child will decrease their resilience to future stressors. And this is why, you know, when it comes to raising your children, my philosophy has always been Prevent trauma. It doesn't matter everything else, just prevent trauma as much as you can. Be there, hug them, take care of them. Also, loving caregivers and support from friends and nice community can buffer your epigenome and also make you more resilient to stress when you get older. For the clones, having so many brothers going through the same crazy situation does make things a lot less scary and stressful. It's one thing to be the only combat veteran in your community and, and suffer quietly with all the things that you're going through. It's another thing to be surrounded by people who are literally like you and have gone through the same thing. I mean, you guys can even start joking about that trauma, which might relieve some stress. Also, judging by young Bubba Fett and just how the clones dealt with a lot of things, the natural resiliency of the Fett clones had to be pretty high, even from early on in life. This is just something that can't be taught. It is genetics. However, even the clones have some limitation with how much stress they can take on. Take Cutler Quain, for instance, one of the few clone troopers who deserted before Order 66. Early on in the Clone Wars, Cutler Quain was on a transport that was shot down by two separatist gunships. He witnessed most of his squad, you know, the people he grew up with, die in this incident. And to make matters worse, those gunships came back and started murdering everyone who had survived the attack. Cutler Quain was forced to flee 
And I'm sure that created a lot of problems for him because not only did he survive this very traumatic event, he was the lone survivor. And I'm sure that creates a lot of guilt. Combine that with the loneliness and you have extreme levels of stress. This event was so traumatic for Cult Lequain that it even overrode his very strong conditioning. After the incident, he reassessed his life and determined that there are more important things in life than serving in someone else's army. He would start a family. And one of the telltale signs that uh, this stress really affected him from a physical standpoint is, well, take a look at his hairline. He's balding in a very different and more severe way uh, when compared to the rest of the clones. And believe it or not, there is now growing evidence that high levels of stress and trauma can accelerate hair loss, not just through, you know, hormonal changes, but also through epi genetic changes that basically shut down hair growth. Obviously, genetics are also a huge player, right? It's not just, you know, the epigenetic uh, changes that are making people lose hair. That, that needs to be clear. So another thing that really messes with your epigenome and how your genes express themselves is just, you know, the toxins that you're exposed to. Are you a smoker? Do you do spice? Are you living on a world with clean water and air like Alderaan, or are you in the lower levels of Coruscant breathing and recycled air and drinking, you know, sewer water? As a soldier, as a clone trooper, you unfortunately are gonna be exposed to all sorts of very, you know, like radioactive and um, toxic substances. It's a part of the job. Whether it's being exposed to the discharge of massive turbo lasers, uh, being on long space voyages without adequate shielding from radiation, or just you know, getting too friendly with some local fauna. These type of environmental dangers can affect your genes. For instance, some diseases like tuberculosis can actually suppress your immune system by using epigenetic effect, which is kind of terrifying. Back in the day, tuberculosis was a complete death sentence. You know, Arthur Morgan, who survived endless shots from repeating rifles, revolvers, and arrows, was cut down by this damn disease. And I'm sure the clones who got trapped in the bunker on Naboo and were exposed to the Blue Shadow Virus, a very deadly plague-like disease, also experienced some permanent changes to their immune system. Because when individual cells are infected, uh, there is an epigenetic shift that usually turns on certain genes that are related to repair or maybe certain other genes are shut off because they're using too much energy and are not considered essential for a cell survival. If those cells do survive the encounter with the blue shadow virus, they will have bookmarked certain genes using epigenetic tags that will be useful the next time there is any exposure. Now lastly, we have nutrition and exercise. These are two factors that the Kaminoans controlled with precision. And through proper nutrition and exercise, you can actually fortify your epigenome from a lot of problems. I imagine that's something the Kaminoans really understood and seeing that this is one of the few things that could actually control, um, they probably focused a lot of attention on it and a lot of resources on it. Diets rich in cruciferous veggies and antioxidants are associated with your harmful methylation patterns linked with cancer. Heavy exercise at a young age leads to epigenetic changes that can lead to a life of better metabolism and lower inflammation, and even faster muscle growth should you start training at a later stage. For all of you out of shape high school athletes, especially you football players who put on a lot of weight to get that muscle, well, getting back into shape isn't as difficult as you think it would be because your body's gonna remember a lot of things from your youth unless you're lazy back then too. Anyway, those are just some interesting concepts to think about. The human body is a completely crazy and ridiculous thing, and we're learning more about how to stay healthy, both physically and mentally, every day. There's a lot of misinformation out there in the world. There's a lot of fear-mongering when it comes to our health and our bodies, but the truth is, our world is rapidly advancing. I know a lot of things seem horrible from an economic standpoint, but, uh, you know, one of the benefits of capitalism is you are pulling money into crazy places and we are creating technology that are truly miraculous. I mean, the mRNA vaccines that were created recently, uh, you know, I know they're very controversial now, but like 50 years from now, they'll probably be seen as one of the biggest leaps in, in science during this period, as big as, you know, the discovery of penicillin. Um, and also we have like, you know, AI becoming more and more incorporated into finding new molecules that can be used to treat all sorts of diseases. Um, you know, there's all sorts of uh, advances in cancer treatments right now, thanks to AI. And maybe one day we'll have quantum computing that will be able to simulate entire human bodies so that doctors can experiment on simulations rather than on animals or, you know, clone troopers. The point is, keep your mind open, keep your eyes open, and 
leave emotion out of it. There's a lot of things you can be afraid of, uh, you can be scared of, but at least make sure you do your own research so you know what to be afraid of and what to watch out for. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.